Isabella and I are just chopped liver for this, right? Yeah. <laughs> Great. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out. Welcome, virtual audience, and welcome, Jeffrey Deaver, back to the poison pen again. Yay! <laughs> and he has a canine fan who will probably climb him. Here she comes. <laughs> well, since I'm going to the dogs at my feet, I guess uh, he or she, who's she? She. What's there you go. Kyrie. Hi, Kyrie. How are you doing? Good baby. She is a very good girl. Normally, she curls up and goes to sleep, and that's kind of the end no, of it. Not but tonight. No. <laughs> Nobody you're, sleeps on my watch. No, your personal magnetism is kicking in here. So, Jeffrey is back this time with a Lincoln Rhyme novel. He, you know, as, as you know, Jeffrey's written many series and many standalones and an uncountable number of short stories and other sorts of things. You're one of the most enterprising authors I know. I have no other talents and plenty of free time, so. Uh. <laughs> and no fallback, right? <laughs> no fallback, right? Although, you know, the, the thing is, I find, it, we, we've talked about this before. I mean, you have this history, you know, you're a lawyer, you've been a musician, you've been a journalist. So when you say you have no fallback, I have some trouble actually believing that. If Are you I just would, rusty everywhere if, else? If I were to represent a client, do you know the word malpractice? That would be a total malpractice. But, you know, I, I mean, I joke. I, when I was an attorney, I was a, um, uh, in Wall Street on New York, and people say, well, Jeff, uh, you write um, books about crime. You must have been a criminal lawyer. And my response is, I represented large multinational banks. <laughs> Draw your own conclusions. <laughs> Very true. So one of the things that um, characterizes the Lincoln Rhyme series is that it is indeed set mostly in New York City, not always, which is kind of your familiar stomping ground, even though you don't live there now. Um, I, I when I, um, I, I write uh, books set all over the world, actually, and uh, I tell um, aspiring writers when I teach my course, uh, you have to know the place you write. And so having lived in New York for about 25 years, I don't really have to research it, um, the area. I mean, y you have to go back and find out if the street has been you know, closed or new uh, construction has gone up. But one thing I found is that I like to make cities characters in themselves so that you get a sense of the place. And uh, that's what I've done with New York. Although once I set a, a book in the Midwest, and I remember going to this place on uh, when I was in college, and it was a for my book, uh, A Maiden's Grave. And uh, there was a scene with this torrential, uh, uh, what do they call it, like white water, things where a couple of hostages escaped, and they're bobbing, are they going to drown or not? And I set that in the book. And I mentioned the name of the river, and then I was at a book event, and somebody came up to me and said, You've been back there lately, Jeff? <laughs> and uh, it turned out that that, had been, that river had been dammed like 10 years before. And they said, they admitted that the worst damage you could do to yourself was to trip over a cow pie. Now, I don't know if you know what a cow pie is, but you can figure it out. So uh, after that, I always go and do my research. Well, very wise. Before you, I go any further, Isabella Maldonado is a wonderful author who is here tonight to also talk to Jeff and her current book, which is, you could hold it up, is a forgotten, is that the current book? I lose track. Coming it's coming out in March. Oh, it's the March book. Okay, and Isabella will be here with Lisa Gardner on March 12th, which is really a banner day. So um, I'm so glad that she lives here and she can join in or actually just take over um, <laughs> some of our some of our author events, which is a nice change for you all. You know, I have to listen to me all the time. Um, before we go any further, is it cooled down enough for you? Um, if so, I'm going to say something intelligent. We are going to make ourselves absolutely comfortable because we have to hear about the latest thing that's going on with Lincoln Rhyme. And of course, the, the question is going to be, I don't know what kind of trouble you're allowed to explain without any spoilers that you've gotten Lincoln into this time. I, I do have trouble uh, talking about my books because, uh, as you know, I, I have my... Uh, 
uh, reversals. A reversal is a twist within the book. You know, you come to chapter uh, six and it looks like the good person turns out to be the bad person. And then there's a the surprise ending. And you know, I like my surprise endings plural. And so it's really hard to uh, to talk about them. But I, I can say a little bit about it. And in fact, if you like, I could read just a tiny bit. Why not? Okay. It's prepared. See, this was not a spontaneous decision. <laughs> There's nothing like an author reading their own words. It's a lot of fun because you get that influence of what was going through their mind as they're talking. It's a very short book. <laughs> <laughs> you have to hold the microphone and start. I will already kind of get someone organized here. I'll set the stage briefly. The watchmaker is uh, Lincoln Rhymes' nemesis. He's Moriarty to uh, Lincoln Rhymes home. Homes. Yes. Oh, <laughs> welcome. For you before we start the reading. So there's plenty of chairs up here. There, there's no pressure while everyone watches you find a seat. It is. Don't it feel is, awkward. It is being live streamed. Don't feel <laughs> nervous about that. I'm very but glad you came, but I didn't want to interrupt to the flow of the reading here. Jeff Good is to see going to read a little bit from his new book, The Watchmaker. I'll set the stage briefly. Uh, the watchmaker is Lincoln Rhymes' nemesis. We met him first in the cold moon, and he and Lincoln have uh, parried, thrusted and parried, uh, going back, uh, I guess that would be over 10 years now. His real name is Charles Vespasian Hale, and um, he, uh, in a recent book, said, Lincoln, the next time we meet um, will be the last. And one of us, I promise you, will not survive that meeting. <clears throat> As with so many human constructs interpreting indifferent nature, time knows no natural intervals. We've decided on hours and minutes and seconds, purely arbitrary. So while it could be said that Lincoln Rhyme would die in five minutes at 10.15 p.m. on Tuesday, May 14th. The most accurate way to put that message is the truism he lived the length of time from birth to death. Requesset in pacem, Lincoln, thought Hale. Crouching in the bushes outside Ryan's townhouse on Central Park West, he pulled out his phone and read the message he just received. It was from the pilot uh, reporting that the plane was in Teterboro, a private airport in New Jersey, ready to go at any time. From there, it would be on to his new life. Pushing the buttons on the keypad of his phone would end Lincoln's, however, and that would be the final cog in his mission tonight. But there was one more chess move before that. Um, next to his, his last one, more Latin words occurred. Pina ultimato, penultimate second to last. So it was with no regret or joy that he now pushed one combination of keys that would detonate the charge in the basement where patrolman Ron Pulaski was held captive. Hale could not afford to keep him alive. Pulaski was heir to Rhymes' skill and had that grit of heart that would motivate him to do whatever it took to find Hale and either bring him to justice back in New York or he believed the officer fully capable of it kill him on the spot. He had to go. And what of Amelia Sachs? Well, she was less of a threat. Justice was within her, certainly, like a diamond vein. But revenge was not. She wouldn't choose to forgo her job of stopping evil in the city for the lengthy and possibly futile mission of pursuing Rhyme's killer. A glance at his watch, Pulaski would be dead now. Pina ultimato. And now for the ultimate or the final task of the evening. Clocks are not moral or amoral. Along the transit of life, they click out the moments of joy and sorrow and pain and pleasure and cruelty, but remain utterly indifferent to what occurs at any particular click. With this thought in mind, Charles Vestasian Hale now tapped the keys on his phone and looked up to Rhymes' townhouse where he saw, well, come on, you know, I'm a suspense writer. So you, 
you really think I was going to finish that sentence? Um, if you want to know what happens, what's the solution? Buy the book, right? Um, Wonderful, Jeffrey. That was a very you. commercial moment. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. So when you call me Vespasian, it's actually the name of a Roman emperor. So mm -hmm. that kind of goes along with the Latin well, quotes that you he, he, and, he and Lincoln trade Latin barbs. I, I took four years of Latin in high school, uh, mostly because there was a cute girl in class. I remember nothing of it. Um, so, um, but I, I can, you know, I can, you can Google anything. You can actually Google Latin translations. You can, oh, oh, or you happened. could sign up for Duolingo, and you can yeah. learn Latin from yeah. scratch, which would be a great well, idea. Thank goodness, one of the characters in the book doesn't survive. Maybe, um, so uh, I don't. I'm not probably not going to have to read any more Latin. So there are two ongoing. Um, well, three, actually, if you've been reading the Lincoln Rhyme series for a long time, one of which, of course, is Lincoln's injury and the small but hopeful progress that he has made towards recovering just a little bit of autonomy. So you've walked him through um, along. How many books is this now? I can't remember. I think the 17th, actually. Okay. So it's, people are nodding, confirming my guess. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Well, I didn't even care. Like Isabella, we keep our heads down and right. And, That's and, right. You know, the, you know, Sherlock Holmes did not know the Copernican theory of uh, the universe. He did not know that the Earth and the planets revolved around the sun because it did not figure into his crime solving. All he knew was that in the morning the sun was in the east and at night it was at in the West, and if that helped him solve a crime, that was good. But the rest of it, he, he went like this to uh, to uh, Watson. He didn't need to know. I'm very much like that. Don't, aren't we somewhat, Isabel? I think so. <laughs> so um, technology has been Lincoln's friend, mm -hmm. and you know, you're you're good. You like technology. You're good with it, and so you've employed that to help him gain a little um, independence. Then we have Amelia, and whatever her journey has been, mm -hmm. uh, which they are now married, and she is still working as a, um, what is she, a captain now? She's, uh, no, she hasn't passed the captain's uh, test yet. All right, she's but she's a, still with the NYPD. She's a lieutenant, yes. Lieutenant, okay. And then, and this is a question I really wanted to ask you about, a repeating villain, you know, um, what are the pluses and minuses of having a repeating villain, and how do you keep it fresh if you're bringing back the same guy? Sure, um, you know, we writers, and Isabella can tell you this as well, but we writers are uh, faced with a dilemma of um, readers. Uh, we, we do this for readers. It's all about you guys. You know, we are irrelevant, totally irrelevant. We, we craft stories for you to make you happy, to thrill you, you know, take you away from the daily cares of life and so forth. That's what this is all about. And so we walk a fine line. You know, we say, okay, if we have a, the, the continuing character comes back, you like that. I know, but that's more challenging to create a, um, you know, a new, fresh story. But nonetheless, we uh, we take that challenge on, and it is indeed a challenge to uh, 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 bring back the same characters and give them a new take on it. There's this adage in Hollywood uh, when a producer is looking for a uh, a new, uh, they call it a product, and that's okay. It is a product to turn into a, a TV show or a movie. Uh, they want something that has. Um, Never been done before, completely new and unique, and yet has been wildly successful in the past. And think about it, and we laugh at that, and we kind of make fun of Hollywood. However, it's true. It's true. We want something that fits a template we're used to, but something new. And so I always you know, give people the same template. Uh, uh, story takes place over about a day or two. Uh, lots of internal rehearsals. There's some hook. I always like my hooks. You know, the, the, the uh, watchmaker's hand is about construction, actually. And as I was driving into uh, Scottsdale the other day in Phoenix, I looked up and saw some of these big construction cranes. Y you know, you've seen them? Don't ever walk underneath one. You certainly won't after you've read the book. And um, so, I, but I got into construction. It's quite uh, quite interesting. And so then, so that's the hook of the book. Uh, you know, the burning wire was about the power grid, and uh, uh, the broken window was about data mining. And I was there before um, Sam Altman and Chat GPT. I point out very quickly. Um, but then there's a surprise, multiple surprise endings. So that's always a given. But then I have to kind of try to make it fresh. So it is a challenge. There's no question about it. But I think on the whole, whether it's a villain or a, um, a hero, 
Um, I think the, um, uh, the readers enjoy spending time with their friends. And, uh, you know, you can be friends with a bad guy. We, uh, you, you know, the, the bad guys have to have a heart, too. The bad guy is the, the hero of his or her own story. And so we kind of root for them in the end. We don't want them to kill our, our, our friends, but, uh, you know, they have something to lose, too. Well, from an authorial standpoint, you have to create a new situation for a known villain. But if you don't do that, you have to create a whole new villain from scratch. So it's sort of like villain world building yep. would be. So either way, it's work. There was a there was a great story I heard a few years ago that a, uh, a young man had written a um, uh, it was his debut debut novel, a uh, crime uh, novel, of course, and uh, he had a uh, detective, New York City detective, who was a good solid detective. You know, nothing wrong with that. But he created a a world class villain. I, I don't know the characters don't know who the villain was, but he was a great villain who kept uh, uh, you know defeating the hero at every turn until. Uh, the final scene where the uh, hero bested him, shot him in the head, and it was said in New York City, again, he fell into the storm drain and was washed into uh, the uh, New York Harbor from Battery Park. And the reviews came out. And the... Um, uh, the, the reviews were, uh, you know, on, on the whole complimentary. They said, uh, you know, good hero, a, a standard detective. You know, we've seen this, this character before. But that bad guy, oh, my God, what an incredible villain this was. Well, the writer was faced with a bit of a dilemma, right? And so um, he meets with his editor, and the editor says, well, <laughs> you know what? We'd like to give you another contract, but next book comes out. Um, who do we meet in chapter one? The villain. He's back again. No, it wasn't a prequel. Second, uh, the, the second paragraph said, miraculously, he survived. Uh, but that's what characters do. You know, they uh, attach themselves to us, whether we like it or not. Um, I'm going to swap seats here with Isabella because she has a bunch of questions. She and Jeffrey actually have been out having dinner and rehearsing. They're part of the program, so well, I will just swap wait, wait, for the over record, there, kiddo. Wait, wait, for the record, not rehearsing, but, but so uh, sure you were. Don't expect much from me, but uh, <laughs> Isabella will do fine. Your water, so. hon. Oh, there you I'm going to I'm going to partake too. I want to. I, I guess I'll give you a chance to have a little drink before a little water there. So I, one of the things you were actually before we get into anything else, you talk about the villains, and I do think this is very interesting, and that people would would find that intriguing about. And I've I've had this happen, and I'm this is obviously what was happening with yours, when your readers almost kind of become obsessed with the villain you create, mm -hmm. and then you feel kind of obligated to explore that more. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah, the, um, um, you know, part of, and I'm sure you'll agree, part of writing is um, a journey for us as well. Uh, not only, uh, you know, learning the craft, which we, Isabel and I pretty much have down now after all the books we've, we've written, there's always tweaking and, you know, one can improve at anything. But um, there's the endless uh, body of information and, uh, you know, psychological insights and uh, th it's called the world out there. And writers are, uh, you know, naturally curious people. And we just want to learn things. And so, um, you know, how do you study good? You know, I guess you have a hero who's diligent, hardworking, resourceful, uh, courageous. That's fine. Uh, there's not a lot of research to do there. Uh, but with evil, evil requires a lot of... Uh, you know, in-depth uh, searching, soul searching, and, um, you know, you can only search so much online. You kind of have to go into a dark space in your your own mind. Now, I, I don't know about you, and it'd be interesting to hear. I can kind of turn it off at the end of the day. You know, it's 5 o'clock in Miller time for me, uh, however dark it's been. Uh, because, you know, I'm pretty aloof. I don't have a lot invested in my characters personally. I have, I, my investment is making sure you're invested in the characters. I'm like the pilot of an airplane, and I see a terrible storm up ahead, and I don't care. It's a storm. I fly through storms all the time. I see a beautiful sunset. Who cares? A beautiful sunset. I fly through sunsets all the time. My job is to make sure the passengers get where they're going through the sun and through the, uh, through the storms. But, um, you know, that involves 
learning all about storms. Sorry, this metaphor is going way too far, but <laughs> but what I mean, do you do you dwell with the villains? Uh, well, it, it's interesting that you ask that. In a sense, um, like you, I I turn it off when I'm not writing, but I've learned, and I will borrow this expression from um, Stephen King. He talks about the boys in the basement. Um, that is his subconscious mind that is constantly dwelling in the dark and thinking of these things. And, um, well, I had to update that, and I call it the gals in the galley. Um, <laughs> Because, appropriate, yeah, appropriate, yeah, appropriate yeah, right. Yeah. Cooking things yeah, up. Yeah. That's what you do in the galley. <laughs> yeah. So, but what, what happens to me? So I turn it off in my, uh, in my conscious mind, but yeah. literally in the middle of the night, I will wake up with an idea yeah. and I've learned to text it to myself so that I will have it the next day. Huh. I don't want to turn on all the lights and start writing. So I just send myself an email or a text and then I get it the next day. Oh. So my subconscious is always there. Always working and, and in dark places and good places too, I assume. That actually reminds Reminds me of a situation I had years ago. Um, I had bought a um, uh, from Brookstone. I guess they're still in business. An illuminated pen it had a, a light in it, and I had a pad of paper. I kept it by the uh, by the bedside table, and I too woke up and had an idea, and I wrote it down, and uh, then went back to sleep. And I woke up and I was very excited because I knew it was a, just a a killer idea, and. Um, I, I looked at it, and I'm, I'm kind of paraphrasing here, but it, it went something like this. Garn dog barpulic caranso. Hollywood will love. And I'm sorry, that was a code that even Dan Brown could not figure out. Um, and uh, so I blame the, um, the death of that wonderful book on Brookstone, and I'm going to sue them because the stupid pen... <laughs> Well, actually, the pen worked fine, my handwriting, and the combination of wakening it at three. But it was an idea, same thing. You know, you, one wakes up, and there it is. It's always there yeah. in the background. Yeah. And actually, you know what? That So that was one of the things I, I did want to ask you about. You do um, probably more traveling than most mm -hmm. anybody that I know. You're, uh, not only do you do book tours, but you also do research. And it was interesting. You were talking about going to New York to mm -hmm. do your research. So I was wondering if you could maybe share a little bit about your experience going to some of these locations and finding inspiration for some of the stories or characters that you write. Sure. Um, yeah, I've, uh, when I started in this business uh, 40 plus years ago, um, I thought I could sit in a dark room and make up stuff because I'd been a lawyer and I sat in a room and I made stuff up. This was being somewhat more legitimate. And I, um, uh, but I didn't know you had to sell them too because books are products. You know, and you've, you've all heard me with my mint-flavored toothpaste story, of course, that we try to make mint-flavored toothpaste, and that's uh, what uh, our uh, books are. There's nothing to be ashamed of calling them products. They're consumer products, um, and they should be. And I'm sorry, uh, you know, Man Booker books are, are, are that is National Book Award, the, the literature, literary books are, um, uh, are uh, products, too. You know, Shakespeare was a product. Rembrandt created a a, a product. Mozart created a product, and by the way, they delivered on time, and um, you know within within budget. So this idea of art versus commerce, I think, is a, a, a non-argument. But I, um, uh, I I learned that one had to sell the books as well. Now I'm I'm fortunate. I enjoy meeting fans. I want feedback from fans. And uh, if I may tell one story of a a, a trip, I was at a um, book event in California. And um, I uh, had done the reading, and a, um, a woman came up to me, I'd say a um, nonagenarian. She was clearly over 80. She was in her 90s, could have been president. I'm not going to talk about that. I promise myself. No politics. But anyway, she was in her, I, I would guess, 90s. And uh, she came up to me and said, uh, Mr. Deaver, um, I'm in a uh, book club in the retirement community right next door, and we read all your books. We love them. Um, but... I had a question about this book, and um, I hope you don't mind, but we have a criticism. And I said, no, no, I want to know. And this is true. I do want to know what somebody doesn't like about the book. Uh, who doesn't like to get praise? Of course, we like that. But, but I want feedback, and I don't pay attention to critics particularly, but I, I want feedback. And she said, well, okay, it has to do with the violence in your books, this one in particular. And I said, okay, tell me. She said, well... 
We think you're going soft on us. <laughs> the bone collector. You had rats crawling all over that girl. The opening chapter, you scalded that couple to death. We love that. This book, one guy got shot and he lived and you stabbed two others. Uh, we want you to get back to your roots. Well, does that mean that I'm going to uh, suddenly do these, uh, you know, like the Saw movies? I don't know if you've seen those with this torture porn kind of stuff. No, because I believe in... Um, you know, suspense. Alfred Hitchcock, not not gore. You know, how many, uh, <laughs> I said this once, how many people here have seen an Alfred Hitchcock movie for the fun of it? You know, you can, oh, you all raise your hands. How many people here have watched an autopsy video for the fun of it? Not professionally. I said that once, a guy raised his hand. And he was, he got his book signed first. I just wanted him out of there. Um, but, um, Anyway, the, uh, you know, this process of uh, 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 traveling, learning things, and experiencing the whole, uh, uh, whole process, I just find, you know, really, uh, really very vital and important. Well, your, your books are in 25 languages and sold all over the world. And so you do travel all over the place and you do appearances and signings and I don't know. Do you think there's a, a difference in, in how your books are received in other cultures? Um, well, to be honest, <laughs> I just got back from an Italian book tour and um, there were um, um, there were a lot of people at the events. I'd have five or six hundred people come come to see me and um, they were very uh, passionate. And now I've been with the um, company there for a long time. I've uh, worked hard to build a following, and uh, Italians are passionate uh, uh, about books, and I, um, uh, you know, I, uh, I, I just, I, I just love that. In some countries, uh, they are, you know, less well received, but um, it doesn't matter as long as I'm there. Uh, and when I, you know, travel, I will do the book event, and then I, I, I travel around and I pick up things. When I wrote um, uh, Carte Blanche the uh, James Bond novel, I hired a driver and we traveled all over uh, England uh, to make sure I got the uh, details right. And uh, I didn't have, well, with one exception, I had, I didn't have any complaints. The exception was this. Did I mention I don't really care for critics very much? Because often they write to hear themselves write. And Isabel and I were talking about it versus the reader influence. And, you know, like take a, uh, an author slash critic like John Updike uh, or Susan Sontag or Harold Bloom. These are, these are critics who uh, didn't write to hear themselves write. You know, they weren't being cute. Uh, they cared about imparting um, information that was helpful to the, the readers. And it was otherwise, you know, what you would have is like this, uh, this uh, pay on, sorry, there we go, sorry. Uh, I'm glad everybody shut their phones off. I hate it when that goes off. But um, this, uh, this critic, <laughs> this is hilarious. Uh, so I wrote the Bond book. Now maybe you don't know, but James Bond cooked. He, he, he was a bachelor, he lived alone, and uh, cooked. And he was actually quite liberal. He didn't insist that the women in his lives cooked. He cooked. And one of the specialties he made was scrambled eggs. It was a very good recipe for scrambled eggs. And I mentioned that in my book. And uh, as uh, you know, one usually does, you try to avoid a synonym. Uh, you try to find a synonym. You know, you, um, when you're writing, Isabella knows this, you, you want to change the word in a, uh, in a single paragraph. And so uh, I use like um, uh, the word, uh, he cooked the eggs, and then the next paragraph, the curds were done. You know, something like that. <laughs> so this this... Critics said, uh, well, the, the American who wrote the James Bond book um, said, uh, the, the guy said something like this, he has managed, it's quite a fine metaphor to refer to the eggs and the curds because uh, this American has managed to, to turn the ethos of Bond into one giant steaming curd. And um, I, I printed that out and cut it up and have it on my wall because it was such a good criticism. Oh, another, a traveling, talking about that, another good story, not to be down on the Brits because I have a very good, uh, a very good response there too. Um, but the, uh, I was at a um, interview, BBC live interview, and the um, um, interviews, radio interviews, I'm sure you, you're familiar with this as well, radio interviews with authors are pretty softball, you know. They're, they're in, in Europe, at least, 
they get the author on, they ask a few simple questions, and because they're waiting for like the real uh, interviewees to come on, and that's a football player or uh, somebody who had dated David Beckham. You know, that's that's all they really care care about. There was somebody who was on EastEnders, their big soap opera show. But oh no, this guy was this live uh, live BBC uh, pres uh, presenter was a. Um, um, you know, a, a, a would-be investigative journalist. And he pointed his finger at me and said, Mr. Deaver, what do you say to the charge that your books are manipulative? Now, I don't think quickly. I rewrite, rewrite, rewrite. But I had a moment of inspiration, and I said, thank you. Because, um, you know, the book should manipulate you. We want to be emotionally manipulated. We don't go to a horror movie thinking I'm going to fall asleep halfway through, right? We want the book. We want to be manipulated. It's a good thing, I think. And uh, he got in a huff, <laughs> but that, that didn't matter. Anyway, and, and I digress. My, if you've read my books, you know I don't digress quite as much as I do. But, uh, but uh, yeah, travel. Those are just some of the, the instances of travel. Yeah. Traveling and, and research going hand in hand, yeah. you know, to yeah. make sure that what you write is authentic yeah. to where you're writing it. And deductible. So <laughs> I was at an event. I think it actually was here in a, some, it may have been Left Coast Crime here. Uh, and I think it may have been in the Phoenix Scottsdale area. I don't remember. But um, I uh, did my, uh, did my presentation and made the joke that I travel a lot and it's fun. I enjoy it. I like to, you know, learn things, sample new cuisines and so forth. And I said, and by the way, you can uh, deduct the costs and just make sure nobody tells the IRS. So I'm signing books. Guy comes up. Oh, we can see where this is going. And he puts, he, he doesn't have a book of mine. He sets a card down. IRS criminal investigative agent. Okay. And uh, he did, joking, he did have a book. He laughed. I laughed. And then he said, and by the way, and he reached into his bag, I have a manuscript here I've written. Would you be interested in taking a look at it? And I could not get the yes out of my voice fast enough. And it wasn't bad. I gave him a little critique and sent it back, and I have only been audited once since then. <laughs> Lucky you. I guess it was a good oh, there's a story there. Yeah, I, I, see. I don't want to ask any more okay. about that. <laughs> My goodness. So, um, well, actually, you know, another thing I was wondering about is obviously when you have your your work turned into something that's on television or movies and, you know, there's always that that transition. And I know I get the question, too, but I'm, I'm sure you do yours with a lot of your experience. Yeah, yours is going to be a, a Netflix show. Yeah. 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 And when, since we're talking about traveling, I know recently you had a little jaunt over to Hollywood. How did that oh. go? Oh, yeah. Hollywood. Oh, that was quite interesting. Um, yeah. I'll tell you this story uh, about a uh, uh, I wrote a book a few years ago called um, um, what was it? Called? Oh, A Maiden's Grave. And um, I heard from an unnamed uh, film company. They wanted to turn it into a, um, a TV movie and invited me out. And I, uh, you know, I was younger then, and uh, things seemed a bit more formal, so I, I wore a suit and tie, walked into the building. I was not only the only one in a suit and tie, I was twice as old as everybody else in the building, and I wasn't that old. So we, we sit down at the table, and they do it right there. I mean, they had, you know, bottled water, and they had a, a big fruit basket. Ever been in a, you know, a meeting, big conference meeting, and, and there's, and it's kind of tense because, you know, you're, you're there to sell your book, and they're there to kind of meet you and so forth. You don't just pick up an apple and start eating it. So I don't know what the fruit was doing there. But anyway, it was a nice fruit fruit basket, a fruit, fruit plate. And um, so um, the only sticking point was the title. They didn't like A Maiden's Grave. Now, um, I said, um, they wanted to call it uh, Dead Silence. And I, um, I explained that A Maiden's Grave was an important plot point in it, and it was uh, really key to a character's arc. <laughs> they didn't quite get that. But, but anyway, they, they were being nice and nodding, and they said, okay. I said, it's really vital. And they, they nodded and said, Okay, they still want to call it uh, 
dead silence. And I pointed out that this very network had not long ago uh, produced a show called Barbarians at the Gate. And uh, there was not a single barbarian or a single gate in that TV show. And um, while there were no maidens and no graves in my book, that seemed to me to be a parallel. And they said, that's very clever, very good. They still want to call it uh, Dead Silence. And I, I grumbled a little bit, and uh, they said, but there's another option. There's another option. And I leaned forward. They said, we can make somebody else's book into a movie. And I said, you know, Dead Silence has a nice ring to it. And um, so we went with that. And I'm not going to tell what company it was, but if you, if you look, <laughs> if you Google it, you're going to see. But, uh, but I didn't say that. You didn't hear me say that. But uh, Hollywood. Do you, do you have any fast Hollywood story or you, you want to share? Well, my, mine's still, you know, in that, in that ether area right. between we haven't started nothing has started right. being shot the, the strike the strike the, yeah slowed everything down everything got everything got put on hold so you know but hey fingers crossed we'll get all of it back on track but things go in the and that, that's the other thing too that that you discover is that things get put on the shelf and sometimes they stay there a while and then other things happen and life happens and you know there's very little control over that aspect of yeah, it. I mean my attitude about uh, anything filmed is that it's advertising that I get paid for and uh, you know um, the you guys are really smart that's why I do three surprise endings because you're going to guess one or two of them at least sometimes all three but you know that if there's a bad movie made of one of our books it's not on on me you know, it's not on Isabella. It's it's hard to make a movie. Oh my gosh, there are hundreds of people involved. There's uh, their egos involved. There's money involved. Bringing all that together is just exhausting to me. I've had no idea to make a film. I've had no idea to write. I had no desire to write a uh, uh, write a project. And um, so uh, there was a story I, I've heard. It was James M. Cain who wrote Postman Always Rings Twice. I've also heard it was Donald Westlake uh, who this happened to. He was in his office being interviewed by a reporter, and a movie, a terrible movie, had just come out based on one of his books. And that's why I suspect it was, it was Westlake, because Cain had some pretty good movies made. And Westlake had some some real dogs made. I don't mean he was even involved in it, but some very, very bad movies were made of his books. And the interviewer said, again, well, Mr. Westlake, uh, what do you think about what the the movies have done to your books? And he got this horror. He was a big guy, larger than life, very theatrical expression. Oh, no. And he spun around in his chair and looked up at his, his rows of books. And he said, turned around and said, God damn it, you scared me. The movies didn't do anything to my books. They're still there, which is true, you know, which is true. They're, the books are, will always be the uh, same. But, you know, I love movies. Were you influenced by movies growing up? Yes. As much TV yeah. and movies? Yeah, yeah, very much. Yeah, yeah. Any kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, commercial storytelling was great. Uh, this has nothing to do with traveling, which we were talking about a minute ago, but another fast anecdote, and then I don't want to take time up from everybody signing books, of course, but... Um, um, I, um, uh, my books are, our books are read by, uh, of course, professional actors uh, in the audi audi Audible book version, whether it's audible.com or somebody else, they're, they're, of course, read. And actors do that. Uh, they moonlight doing it. And uh, I had, uh, one of my books came out, <clears throat> actually, it was A Maiden's Grave, <clears throat> set in Kansas. And um, I had just heard, uh, I just seen The Civil War by Ken Burns. Wonderful wonderful multi-part series narrated by David McCulloch, who's, you know, who just passed away recently. Brilliant historian, brilliant writer, and what a voice, uh, an incredible voice. So I, I um, uh, the uh, producer at the book, co the publishing company, had uh, left me a message saying, Jeff, who would you like to, to narrate your book? And I, I thought, well, it's probably beyond hope. But I left a message back saying, David McCulloch, I would be s just honored if he would be interested in doing it. Next day, I get a call. Jeff, good luck. David McCollum has been a fan of yours for a long time, and he is happy to do the reading. 
This is Ilya Kuryakin from The Man from Uncle, a ducky from NCI, uh, NCIS. Uh, okay, so a um, not David McCulloch, a, a McCulloch, and so a Scotsman portraying a Russian doing a Kansas accent is the one who read my book. But you know, I love the man from uncle and I still actually have my man from uncle card that says I have to be ready at a moment's notice to go um, and help them out. I'm still waiting. Given politics in, in Washington, I think it could happen at any time, so. Narrators are wonderful and um, you, do you, know, do you guys, um, I read and listen uh, to so many audiobooks. Do you guys also do audiobooks too? Or, uh, yeah. I find that a lot of readers do both. And um, a narrator is just so important to find exactly the right person to be able to express. And it's kind of funny because many people have asked me, oh, do you read your own stuff? And I'm like, ah, no. You really need a lot of training behind you to be able to do that. I, I, I tried. I, you know, I write my short story collections. <clears throat> and they have a... a um, um, like a three chapter, I'm sorry, a three paragraph introduction. That's all there is to it. Jeff, would you like to read the introduction? Sure. I go into a studio. Oh, that's not good. Because it's like a fishbowl. And there's the producer there. If you've ever seen like, you know, Bohemian Rhapsody or these control booths and uh, they're, they've got all these controls. Well, it's not like uh, like Nashville or Hollywood, but they've got little buttons and slider things that go up and down. And then they stare at you, and you put your paper in front of you, and they say, and a little red light comes on, and it's a go. And I don't know, 20 takes later, 50 takes later, I finally went through it nonstop. Now, they can patch it together, but they prefer you to read for continuity's sake. And then I was so happy at the end, I kind of put the papers together, and he said, Nope, got some paper shuffle. We have to do it over again. Never again. Zero again. And then, you know, John Le Carre was probably my favorite author of all time in the, the uh, uh, you know, the, the uh, genre writing, although he would have disputed that he was genre, but he was. He was a crime spy writer. And he read his own books in English, French, and German. I hate him. <laughs> Yeah, it makes you really feel inadequate <laughs> doing that. But we are very grateful, of course, that everybody is still buying physical books. You know, that's really where it's at. Having that feel of the paper and the book and everything and, you know, coming to places like this at the Poison Pen and getting your books and then talking to the author, getting them signed. It's really great to talk to the readers, isn't it? Oh, yeah. And the feedback like that woman in... Uh, um in California. Um, the other thing is that I have, um, uh, I, I've actually done a bit of study on this and that <clears throat> the um, experience of a story, and I mean the substantive experience, I don't mean like the ocular experience, the eyes, um, but the experience emotionally of a story is enhanced by reading it on paper. It just is. I, uh, you know, I publish a lot online that's available only in ebooks. I understand that, and it's it's wonderful. But just the act of opening up a paper book and, um, you know, reading the words there, I don't know. Maybe it's because the way I grew up. I don't know because I remember uh, spending my um, allowance. Uh, I got twenty five cents a week, and that went for as soon as it came out, a signet, uh, Ian Fleming, James Bond novel. That dates me a little bit, of course, uh, but it was the 1950s and uh, 60s, and uh, that just, I can still remember the smell of that. You know, I'd hold the book up, and uh, you can do that to my book tonight if you want. I mean, wait till you leave, but if you want, you can certainly. But you know that smell? It's the ink and the paper and everything. There's just something special about it. You are so literary. I took my quarter up to the five and dime and bought comic books. Come on. <laughs> Batman, Wonder Woman, all that I great bought, stuff. Graphic novels, too. they're called today. Yeah, I bought, I bought comic books. And apparently War and Peace was longer in the, the real version. So 
we should take audience questions. Yep. But Jeff, before we do that, tell us what you're working on because you're always like two books ahead of wherever we are. Yeah, I've and been doing... you don't do a Lincoln rhyme sure. every time. This is a uh, this is a Coulter Shaw book I'm working on, and um, if you uh, have uh, taken a look at my website. Um, the uh, the movie I'm sorry TV series Tracker is coming out on uh, CBS based on kind of an amalgam of my prior Coulter Shaw books The Never Game The Goodbye Man and The Final Twist and a bit of Hunting Time thrown in although Hunting Time was written after the TV show was and it uh, uh, stars Justin Hartley as uh, Coulter Shaw and it um, if you follow uh, football at all I don't I'm told it's a little bit of of an anomaly because they throw it mostly. I mean, they kick it with their foot sometimes. It's not like football over in Europe. But anyway, if you watch the Super Bowl, I, I digress. If you watch the Super Bowl, it airs on CBS right after the Super Bowl. So just get extra popcorn, take a bathroom break in the last five minutes of the Super Bowl, and because what's coming up is more important, and then just uh, enjoy the show then. But uh, the, my new Coulter Shaw book is... Um, I'm working on now, and uh, there actually will be a, uh, a Phoenix Scottsdale uh, tag in it, and I can't say anything more because I have to leave you all in suspense. Now, don't forget, the last we left, Lincoln was about to be blown up, so you have to buy that book. <laughs> now you have to. Are there any questions that anybody has? We can take, and we'll call on you. You know, yeah, if we don't right. if nobody volunteers. Okay, good. <laughs> okay. Yes, please. Oh, hi. Yes. Thank you for being here. Hi. Thank you. mentioned just a moment ago about releasing some short stories um one series being the sleeping doll which mm -hmm. is actually four right short it's if i may it's it's the broken doll. broken doll a book i wrote was the sleeping doll you're you're right on that regard but it, this is called the uh uh the uh, sleeping doll i'm sorry the broken doll yeah sorry <laughs> i'm on book tour no i'm confused anyway As a reader, it's been fun to read those because usually with the way that you develop your characters and the scenes, it's a while before you kind of see what's going on. Mm -hmm. Whereas the one that I was just reading, it was a man who was spending time with his teenage kids and it said, oh yeah, and they don't know, I just killed their mother. Yeah. And yeah. It was like right in the beginning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering, um, a writer, do you find it? more challenging to write a short story than your traditional book? Uh, no, no, it's not. Uh, short stories uh, uh, exist for the twist primarily. Um, the um, a novel requires um, a great emotional engagement on the part of the um, uh, the reader. We want to grab you by the lapels in the opening scene and hold your, hold your heart and your gut uh, through to the end. Uh, with surprises along the way. Um, but in my books, good prevails. Um, the bad guys meet their just ends. And uh, I think because we, uh, again, I, I don't care myself particularly. I mean, I like that. I like those stories. But I want to make you guys happy. And, you know, we like happy endings uh, better. But a short story is different because um, the, um, uh, the, 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 the payoff, the benefit is the twist. I wrote one where a um, um, we see a 12-year-old uh, girl who's being stalked, uh, a guy from school, middle schooler, watching her all the time. Never touched her, but was just creepy, watching her all the time. And um, uh, she uh, goes up to her father uh, in tears and says, Daddy, he was in my bedroom, and uh, he, he opened my drawers. And the next thing we see uh, the kid has been beaten to death. And it was the father's um, a golf club, the murder weapon. And the guy is arrested and goes to prison for killing the kid. And um, he um, is nonetheless lauded as a hero. And people say he stood up for his daughter because this kid was going to do something bad to her. Well, the final paragraph is uh, it turns out that dad would not let the daughter go to the prom and she needed to get rid of dad so she could go to the prom. So she's the one 
who set up the guy. And the line at the end is the mother comes to the daughter's room and she's dressing in her prom dress with a little corsage on or whatever. And the mother says, oh, your golf instructor called. Do, are you going to be there for your golf lesson on Monday? And she says, I don't need to. I've learned everything I need. And so we don't like anybody in that story, but you can get away with that in a short story. Uh, the Broken uh, the broken uh, Doll is a little bit different. It's a Quentin Tarantino uh, fractured time sort of story. Four stories that are related. Each one informs the other story. And as it moves along, we learn that what we learned in the prior stories is um, uh, completely uh, completely wrong. And so it's, it's kind of like a novella. It's 62,000 words or so. So it's a kind of a novella. Very fun. And uh, that will be a, I uh, can't give too many details away, but it will be a, uh, uh, a thing on TV, a streaming thing on TV. So uh, maybe another question. And I promise Wait, I, I want to say something, Jeffrey. Oh, and you're, not everybody can do both. You have an amazing facility for writing long, complicated novels and short stories, but there are many, many authors who just can't do that. And I've I think that, it's yeah. so easy for you. And I yeah. think you, you know, you attribute that to other authors who I, really. I'm, I'm just, yeah, I'm just very lucky. I, I, I yeah, it's just the way your mind works. Yeah. But you know, it most of the time it's hard for novelists to write short stories. Well, speaking of the way the mind works, um, my first uh, collection of short stories was being uh, prepared by the publisher, and they said uh, uh, at a meeting, editorial meeting, <clears throat> they said, uh, "Well, Jeff, we're looking at titles, and we want to." We're thinking of, you know, naming it after you. And I said, well, you know, like the collected stories of so and so, Jeffrey Deaver, whatever that, uh, that doesn't really sing. And they said, oh no, we want to name it Twisted, <laughs> and after you. And I laughed, and that's the name the title that came out. And it was, uh, it. And then we did more Twisted after that, and then Trouble in Mind. And now I've got uh, three more collections. I'm trying to get published right at the moment. So uh, we'll another uh, fifty, another fifty short stories. Okay, please. You also say that you teach a writing course? I do, yes. Uh, not uh, This is not through a university, but it's a uh, uh, commercial course. I mean, I give it away at like writers' conferences and things. It's a four hour course um, uh, writing called Writing Commercial Fiction. And if you're interested in taking it, um, just check my website out. And it's, uh, it's not, uh, there's no workshopping. I don't want you to write anything, you just take notes. And it's it's kind of Jeff talking to Jeff. I'm not telling you to do anything. Writing's the most subjective thing in the world. But I'm just saying this is what's worked for me. Yes, sir. Young lady who she's got four years of Latin in high school. Mirabile dictu. Yes. Yeah. No, she went. She never even returned my phone call the day we graduated. I was. So sad, yeah. I mean, it was just, it was just awful, and yeah, I don't know. Not that I'm bitter about it still, but okay, I, we're all, we're all good. So maybe one or two more. Yes, sir. Um, so I wanted to say thank you for being here. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Uh, I'm honored to be here because uh, I grew up a James Bond fan, still a James Bond fan, uh, and in that community. Uh, Fleming's writings are uh, scripture, mm -hmm. if you will. So, in fact, a lot of people refer to it as reading the scripture of Fleming. And you're part of that now. And thank you for that. For well, thank you. And, uh, but I wanted to ask you about the, about writing the, the James Bond book. First of all, the, the first question is, did you have any particular actor in mind as Bond as you were writing him? And second, can you... Sort of tell a, a little bit of the story about how that came to be, uh, you being able to write. Sure. And because uh, my memory isn't great, I'll answer the first one first before I forget. Guy Pierce is the one I pictured as Bond. Uh, Daniel Craig uh, is not Bond. Um, the others were good. But, you know, the movies are very, very different from the books. And the the, the book I wrote um, is uh, it's set in the modern day, but it hews to the original Bond formula. Uh, coincidentally, some, some very accurate things. Uh, the original Bond was a, a veteran of Afghanistan in the war. He was a Navy officer, a Naval officer, and then moved into Naval Intelligence. And um, my Bond was um, very similar because I wanted 
modern day readers, many of whom don't know that Bond was a, a literary character. They think only of the movies. And um, I wanted them to experience a young Bond, vivacious characters, uh, not a womanizer. Uh, Bond in the original books wanted to get married. He did, didn't end well, but he uh, he did uh, want to get married, married and settled down. He also was very nihilistic. He, uh, you know, he was an assassin. The double O didn't mean that he was allowed to shoot somebody in self-defense. It meant he walked up behind somebody on the streets of Singapore, put a bullet in the back of their head, disposed of the gun, and then returned to England. And he was thrown into a depression for months afterwards. He had to wrestle with taking a life, but he did it for queen and country. And that was the kind of bond I wanted to uh, wanted to create. And how it came about, um, I won an Ian Fleming Award, uh, uh, an award called the Steel Dagger Award, offered by the Ian Fleming Estate. And um, it was... Um, uh, a, a presentation in England. I gave my uh, uh, thank you and mentioned that Bond was a big in, Ian Fleming was a big influence on me. The estate heard that the Ian Fleming estate and just called me up and asked me if I wanted to do a uh, uh, write the Bond book, and I did. And that was that was history. They asked me if I do another one, but um, I I don't own the copyright to it. That's the only thing I've written. I don't own the copyright to, and um, I uh, I was on to other other things. Maybe, uh, well, I guess uh, we do want Patrick to sign up. Patrick has, has questions from... Oh. oh, I'm sorry, sure. And, and one of them is just about, about foreign translations of your, of your work. Mm -hmm. um, have there been any... Has anything been missed in translation that you're aware of? Or are you concerned about that? I don't know. I don't speak the languages <laughs> they're translated into. I'm being, I'm being a little silly there because I have friends who have read them. And... Um, um, you know, you you kind of take a chance when you do um, books like this, and you hope for the best. I have uh, always been available if a, a, an interpreter or the translators, not interpreters, calls me up. Uh, of course, the you know it's the idioms that are kind of a problem. But what we try to do is make it a local idiom. Uh, you know, an, an English expression. Um, that has no reference in uh, Chinese or in uh, Spanish will um, be translated as best one can. And um, I'm just delighted that uh, they've been in uh, that. You've got what? You've hit 25 too, right? 24 for me. 24, 24. I'm still catching up to you. <laughs> yeah, you slacker. <laughs> That's who it was in Latin. That was the girl in my Latin class. No, I'm just kidding. It wasn't. Uh, let's see. She says, okay, so Coulter and Lincoln are in the same universe and will meet up in a book. Mm -hmm. Any timeline for that? Um, yes, I do have that planned. It will be, um, I've got uh, 2025, uh, quote, booked up, but it will uh, very likely be the book after that. Yeah. And I'm going to get uh, Catherine Dance, too, because uh, Catherine Dance, I know people like Catherine Dance, and uh, being the, um, uh, did I mention, salesman, business person, creating a product, um, I can't mention the name of the company again, but we've had an offer uh, for, to do a uh, TV series about Catherine Dance. And so, um, uh, you know, whether it's going to happen or not, I don't know. If it does, I'll get the books going again. And I have a Catherine Dance book done, but, uh, you know, um, I don't... Um, uh, farm out the books. I, I like James Patterson. He's a friend of mine, and I respect what he does because he gets people reading. That's it's wonderful. I just can't give somebody an idea and then, you know, have the um, uh, have a book, a Catherine Dance book produced. I look at you, sir, because you seem to be a Catherine Dance fan. Yeah. Been a while. Yeah. Last question. Um, can this new book be read as a standalone? Uh, Watchmakers. Oh, well, it could be read without reading the other books. I mean, it is, yes, indeed. It's, I, I see. It's not a standalone, but uh, no, all of my books can be read by themselves, independent of the others in the series. All right, well, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Isabella, Barbara, everybody with Poison Pen, and uh, viewers, and any canine. Uh... So Patrick asked me, I'm not going to, I don't think I, I'm giving it away, right? Because that's yours. But Isabella, there's an author named Terry Hayes who wrote a book called I Am Pilgrim. T. 
10 years ago, which is, was a huge international bestseller. And amazingly, 10 years now, he's actually written a new book, and he will be here. Uh, date of that? No, it's right before, it's the 12th, because Greg Hurwitz is the 13th, right? That's how I remember all this stuff. Right, so anyway, Terry is coming here from Australia, and he will be here on February 12th. And as you can see, it's a very substantial book. But if you've never read I Am Pilgrim, I'm sure that the publisher, not being asleep, is reprinting it as, <laughs> as I'm speaking, right? And I would really recommend that you read it. As far as I know, uh, they are completely different. I mean, it's not a sequel. But um, it really was a, a huge thing. And um, it was a bestseller all around the globe in umpteen languages. And he signed copies for us, but he didn't actually come here. But we did. Um, we sold a lot of them back then. So I just wanted, Patrick thought you'd like to see that it's not a phantom because it's been in the works for so long, right? I know, it's like the phantom book or something of the sort. Um, and I'll remind you that Isabella and Lisa Gardner will be here on March 12th. And Jeffrey, are you still on a every year cycle? You used to publish more than one time a year, but yeah, I don't think I, you I know have been lately. I know this is a shock to everyone, but I'm, I'm not as young as I used to no. be. No. Um, but um, I'm taking a little uh, time off to do some other projects and things, and so. Uh, but I. Um, but basically, I'm getting these uh, short story collections underway. I've got to get 50 short stories in print, and they will be in print. Um, and maybe I'll come back next uh, fall with my short story. Well, collection that would be wonderful. We'd always love to have you. So is Calder Shaw not going to come out at this time next year? Uh, probably not this time. No, no, probably not. But but not long after that. Okay. I have to write it first. I mean, there's that technical little thing. Yeah. I know. I, and I do not use chat GPT, just for the record. Uh, no, you're an authentic voice. My sister, uh, who works with me, uh, just for the fun of it, said write um, uh, to chat GPT, not the four, but the basic one, uh, write um, a few paragraphs about Lincoln Rhyme in the style of Jeffrey Deaver. And out it popped, like in, within seconds. And it was, uh, it was good. He was investigating a crime in the Empire State Building. And it lost a little credibility when it said he had to run after the villain down 30 flights of stairs. So watch that data scraping, everybody. All right. All right. We'll sign up. Oh, go ahead. Just no, I was just going to say, I don't think you have anything to fear from chat. No, no, no. Not at all. So I'm going to um, ask Jeffrey and Isabella to stay here at the table because they are at photographing height and so forth. So if you'd like to get a book signed. If you'll fold up your chairs and move them over to that wall and then line up, that would be great. Thank you all very much for coming. Okay. There, that was good. Here's here.